everyone. Everything has a story to tell. Some of these stories never see the light of day, remain a secret forever. My story, on the other hand, surfaced by chance about 15 years ago. A tale unknown until recently. A mysterious, thought-provoking, extraordinary story. Right on this tiny planet, lost in space. Enter Homo sapiens, namely the cognizant human, who appears as the main character in this extraordinary tale. But what does man from a mystical and scientific perspective know about himself? What we think we already know soon gets blown in the wind. Some incorrect, others lacking detail. New stuff keeps bubbling to the top. Old taboos come tumbling down and human history is rewritten at every step of the way until the next discovery. Should we dissect the four million years of human evolution on this four billion year old planet through Homo habilis, Homo ergaster, Homo erectus? We find that the contemporary human's prototype goes only as far back as 200,000 years to Homo sapiens, a tiny dot amidst a very long line of evolution. But from our perspective, that is when the game truly began. Three pounds of grey matter inside a skull began to work and continued to flourish as it had done with no being before. From the first artwork on cave walls to farming of the land and creating cultures, eventually our brain implemented its most important achievement around 5,000 years ago. Putting spike on stone, man created writing. Records started being kept, thus written history was born. The cognizant humans stood almost idle for 195,000 years, started passing along written records 5,000 years ago, and as a result took off like a rocket. With the impetus of the Industrial Revolution 200 years ago and the push of the communication age through the last 20 years, this rocket eventually reached light speed. But hold on a minute, I already told you, my story challenges common beliefs. It goes off the beaten track, taboos come tumbling down here, and egos get crushed under it. The essence of my story goes back 12,000 years. May I introduce to you the world's first temple. The quest of insight to this extraordinary finding took me to several well-known authorities in their field, namely German archaeologist Klaus Schmidt, practicing Sufi Turkish Metin Bobarolu, and East Indian astronomer B.G. Sidharf. Supporting experts will appear as we go along. Let's begin with Klaus Schmidt, head of the Gobekli Tepe Archaeological Dig, who brought this all to light. He works for the German Archaeological Institute, has made Urfa his home for the last 25 years, overseeing excavations in this area. Enter Klaus Schmidt and his version of Gobekli Tepe. We are excavating here now since 13 years. And what we understood in, in, uh, with all this work, it's a, really a sanctuary site. It's not a normal settlement site as the uh, other sites we know from this period. Sites like Chayani or Nevalichori in Turkey or like Murebet in Shafil Ahmar in Syria. These are settlement sites, but here it's very different from these sites. So we have uh, here mainly uh, uh, installations which are not, have not been used for domestic life. It's clear they had been used for ritual purposes, for religious, for religion. Now they are temples. When we want to find a short word, so this site mainly consists of Stone Age temples. Stone Age temples, Gobekli Tepe. But where on earth is this place? 12 kilometers away from Shanla Ulfa, formerly Ulfa, on top of a hill, smack in the middle of the Fertile Crescent, which, with the life support of the Euphrates, is considered to be the birthplace of agriculture, going back some seven to 8,000 years. Ulfa, one of the most mystical locations in Anatolia, is also known as the City of Prophets. Take the seat of Abraham, Eup, add the proximity to the old city of Haran, and Urfa's place in the history of religion becomes more than significant. Bolak Lagoon, translation Fish Lake, is considered to be another one of such mystical places. There is a verse in the 21st Surah of Prophets in the Quran, interpreted as to be about Bolak Lagoon. They said, 
If you're going to do anything, burn him and protect your gods. And we said, O oh, fire, be cool and harmless for Abraham. By all religious books, Abraham is considered to be the father of monotheist religion. If we dissect his name, we make some interesting discoveries. Brahma, the supreme being in East Indian doctrine, or the Abba Ra Him, father of the people of light in old Egypt. Phonetically, both bear great resemblance to Abraham's name. We still have no idea how this follower of God, father of monotheism, was connected to Gobekli Tepe, only 12 kilometers away from Urfa, and the Bullock Lagoon. Let us find out how Klaus Schmidt came upon this once-in-a-lifetime discovery. I found it in 94, but it was not completely unknown before, but I recognized the site as a sanctuary site of the 10th millennium. So we are here in a, in a very exposed uh, position on top of the mountain, uh, the highest place here in the region, so it was clear so they, they, they chose this place because of its uh, uh, visibility, the importance of the, of the, of the location. Yes, it was not hidden in some valley or in the plains, but it was on top of the, the highest mountain here, visible from all sides. In terms of dating an archaeological find, the biggest support comes from chemistry. A test called radiocarbon dating was implemented on some of the samples from Gobekli Tepe. The result? This, the oldest of temples which saw the light of day, was built 12,000 years ago. What we are excavating now is belonging to the 10th and 9th millennium. But we don't have the oldest layer, so maybe the oldest layer is a little bit earlier than 10th millennium, nearly 12,000 years. A whopping 12,000 years ago when, put into perspective, some 7,000 years before the megalithic monument in England, Stonehenge was ever made. Of course, the question here is how and why would nomadic cavemen hunter-gatherers, so to speak of, even before reaching the age of settlement, contemplate such a monument? Was the Homo sapiens of then, who supposedly spread out from Africa some 40,000 years ago, a different species from the human we know today? Who is this Stone Age character and what was he capable of? Now this question is directed at Professor Mehmet Özdoğan, researcher extraordinaire of this era and head of the prehistorical archaeology department, Istanbul University. Buna gezginci, yani besin üretimi yapmıyorlar, besin topluluğu avcı, balıkçılık olabilir, bitki toplayıcılığı, avcılık olabilir, çok farklı kök toplayıcılığı olabilir. E, bu insanlar bunu uzun süre geliştiriyorlar. Bununla beraber insanın yani sadece Bir yandan biyolojik evrim var insanın. Yani soyutlama yetisi, el hareketlerini kullanışı, sinir sistemi gibi bir biyolojik evrim geçiriyor. Doğal çevre sürekli olaraktan değişiyor. Ve insanın bununla beraber teknolojisi de gelişiyor. Yani daha hassas aletler yapabiliyorlar. Bu sürecin sonunda, son buzul denemi bittikten sonra, yani günümüz iklim koşullarına geçildiği zaman ki başarı 10 14 bin yıllarında itibaren, dünyada her yerde iklim kuşakları diğer değiştiriyor. Bizim bölgemizde de, Doğanın çok zengin olduğu bir dönemde, özellikle Güneydoğu ve Orta Anadolu'da, burada da daha tarama, üretime geçmeden yerleşik yaşamı sağlayabilecek bir fiziki ortam ortaya çıkıyor. Point well taken, but even if a settlement is born, Göbekli Tepe begs to differ. It is not a settlement. When even agriculture is still a far cry away and scripture has another 7,000 years to come, what pushes the Neolithic human to create such a monumental sacred complex? I know this was a big surprise because we, we didn't expect such a, uh, a developed architecture in context with late hunter-gatherer societies. Hunter-gatherer societies had been dominating the, the, the human history in the old Stone Age, they are all hunter-gatherer societies, farming was not invented. And uh, we, so I, so the common idea was that from very primitive beginnings, as a civilized way of life, developed here in the Near East uh, with, with the settled societies. And now we, we, we understand that it's much more complicated. It all boils down to this. New information forces us to review everything we supposedly knew about human history. Starting with hunter-gatherers who, before concepts such as settlement, agriculture and livestock farming even developed, brought into existence such an architectural feat. 
the preservation really is fantastic in not in every circle but in especially in in circle D which is very well preserved and this preservation it's explained because in in stone age times period times uh, these circles had been buried completely. They had been backfilled by a lot of, of material. Uh, some hundred cubic meters of material had been used to, to, to bury this, this uh, circle. Say again? Buried temples? Apparently so. These people went to great lengths to entomb these structures and by doing so created a hill of 300 meters in diameter, as seen in this photograph before the excavation began. Maybe that's why they call it Göbekli Tepe in Turkish, which means Potbelly Hill. Let's move from structural to spiritual. To build a temple, the first thing one needs is faith. Did we come across any evidence that symbolized the faith system adopted by these people? Bir kere konutlardan, yani normal oturulan evlerden, insanların yaşadığı evlerden çok farklı özel olarak yapılmış, hatta tapınak diyebileceğimiz özel yapıları görüyoruz. Bu tamam plan tipi, iç, iç dizaynı, yapım tekniği vesaire bakımından tamamen konutlardan. Demek ki bir özel bir tapınak yani inanç sistemini sembolize eden ve toplumda bunun imajını yaratan bir sistem oluşmuş. Apparently, around 11 to 12,000 years ago, there already was a notion of building common use temples in this area, such as Chayonu, Halan Chemi and Nevali Chori. The likelihood of Göbekli Tepe having taken the lead in this is quite plausible, for this was the first temple complex in this area. As a result, during the following millennia, the same pattern and order as in Göbekli Tepe was seen at cult structures in settlements all around. Yüksek taş duvarlar. Duvarlarda nişler ve payandalarla hareketli bir duvar yapılmış. Duvar boyunca bir sekiler var, yani birilerin oturup tören seyredebildiği anlaşılıyor. Tabanları suya, sıvıya geçirmeyecek bir tabandır. Yani ya terazi taban, kum taban, taş kaplama gibi. Yani orada da bir sıvılı bir tören yapıldığını yorumlayabiliriz oradan. Bu kan mı, su mu, o ayrı, içki mi o ayrı bir hikaye. Ama bir sıvının, kimi serçe yönünde su kanalları da bulduk. Yani sıvı akıtma kanalları da vardır. Yani bir sıvı ile bir tören yapıldığı anlaşılıyor. Ve burada da e, farklı betimlemeler var. Bunun için de işte Nevala Çörü'de, Göbekli'de olduğu gibi yahut... E, Diğer başka yerler, heykeller, hayvan heykelleri, kabartmalar, boyayla yapılmış figürler gibi çok farklı. Yani tam yorumlaması şu anda çok güç bunların daha yeni yeni bu ortaya çıkıyor bu kavramlar. Ama törenleri, sembolizmin çok ciddi bir oldu. Ve artık sanat diyebileceğimiz kadar usuplaşmış yani. Herhangi birinin rastgele yaptığı resmi heykeller değil. Belli bir uzman sanatçının elinden çıkmış, o uslubu bilen birilerinin yaptığı şeyler var. Toplum ve kademeler gayet belirlenmiş o anlaşılıyor. Bunun da arkasında uzun bir geçmiş gerekir. Social hierarchy, symbolism, and rituals where liquids were used, we'll get into details later, but first comes a left brain question. Just how did they do it? What tools did the builders of Gobekli Tepe temples use to erect and carve such monumental structures? The main tool, the main raw material for tools had been a flint, which is uh, very common here in this region. And so the, on Gobekli there are tons of flint tools. This was a, a normal tool for Stone Age people. With flint, they also could carve the limestone very easily and very well to, to make the reliefs, to make the sculptures and so on. Here are the tools we assume they built these temples with. A magnificent achievement. Carving colossal blocks of limestone, 40 to 70 tons each, with these simple utensils, considering that these monoblocks of rock, the T-shaped pillars, vary anywhere between three to six meters in height. Furthermore, the quarry they got these blocks from is about two kilometers away, and how they got them from there to the temple site is another mystery in itself. Then let's question the architecture of this first temple known to us. Was there a plan to all this? This is not only one temple, there are many temples. So we, we know from uh, the excavation and from geomagnetic research there are at least 20 installations, which we should call temple. Mind-boggling. At Göbekli Tepe, only six of a possible 20 temples have been unearthed as of today. The tip of the iceberg, one might say. Down below, another 14 are waiting to see the light. 
and they're all following one main uh, idea. The main idea is there are two very huge, two monumental pillars in the center of such an installation. There are enclosures and the enclosure walls are surrounding them and there are more pillars set in the enclosure wall. So we have uh, the appearance is more of a stone circle than of a building. And uh, it's uh, quite clear that the monumental stone circles had not been roofed. So there was no roof, there had been open air installations. These same era temples from 12,000 years back unearthed at Gobekli Tepe, show three different styles of form. They have been categorized as B, C and D, all with different patterns. For example, while the pillars at C form a spiral, the same at D have an elliptic pattern. There is also the fact that the surrounding pillars at said temples vary in number. The only similarity between the two are the facing twin T pillars at their respective centers. One might ask, what on earth do these T-shaped pillars depict? In the center of the whole story are the T-shapes, because we can understand the T-shape as a stylized human being. We can be sure because in some cases we have the arms and we have the fingers depicted. So we have a stylized human being, this is a, a T-shapes as human beings, and so we understand these stone circles as a gathering, as a meeting of such stone beings. Two very important in the center, surrounded by other ones which are looking similar, which are smaller, less in size. This first gathering that laid the foundation stone of uncharted human history apparently happened at Gobekli Tepe. Then what are these pillars trying to tell us? So and on these uh, sto uh, stone beings we have uh, very often carvings of animals or abstract symbols uh, in, in combinations, in scenes. So they're, sometimes they're really they are acting on these uh, pillars. So the idea is that we that these Stone Age stone beings are telling us, or, or the, the carvings are telling us stories about them, what, what's, what's going on. They are telling us uh, myths of, the, of this, this time. At Gobekli Tepe, there is a symbolic statement passing us data from 12,000 years back. There is the depiction of abstract symbols, as well as vivid animal carvings of the fox, the boar, the crane, the snake, the spider and the bull. The hieroglyphics of ancient Egypt, to our knowledge the birthplace of scripture, were also known as sacred signs and revolved around symbols. When we look up the word symbol from Old Greek symbolane, this is what we come across. In the broadest sense, a symbol is a device used as an identifying mark. A symbol is also the key to understand and recall the transcendental and timeless values it represents. But how does the human mind produce symbols? The answer to that question I found in Istanbul. Let me introduce Metin Bobarolo, author of numerous books on ancient wisdom and Islamic mysticism and host of a TV show on Anatolian wisdom. Göbekli Tepe had a special mention on one of his shows. E, sembolik anlatımlar çok yüksek şuuru gerektirir veya zekanın e, gevir, evrilmiş bir biçimini gösterir. O zaman e, avcılık ve toplayıcılık dönemindeki bir insanın böyle bir şeyi, e, sembolik düşünmeyi e, kültürel bir nesne haline getirmesi olana pek yok. Çünkü karşılaşmadık daha önceki şeylerde bulgularımızda arkeolojik buluşları e, anlamlandırabilmemiz için sembolik anlatım olan mitoloji dilini de bir kullanmamız lazım ve bilmemiz lazım. Hı hı. Mitolojiyle bakmamız lazım bu olguya. Apparently the people at Göbekli Tepe wanted to leave messages for the future by staying truthful to their primal times. Shall we call this attempt pre-scripture? Sure, it's not writing in the sense of uh, uh, of science which uh, can be phonetically expressed. So, uh, true writing means we we can uh, we have uh, language. 
but here we have something different. We have uh, symbols which are um, expressing stories, maybe. So not in connection with, with language and not in connection with, with, with phonetic terms, but ideas. They are expressing ideas, they are expressing stories. Symbolically speaking, among the unearthed portion, the most expressive and resourceful temple at Göbekli Tepe is currently the one marked D. Temple D is surrounded by 12 stylized humans in the form of T shapes. The number 12 has a special place in mythology and the history of religion. We will look into that in a moment. But for now, let us look at a certain pillar called T number 33 and the symbols engraved on it. This pillar, we have a very, very interesting sequence of motifs, which are here in a, in a vertical row which is much more than just decoration. And this sequence of motives, yeah, it's, it's reminding us uh, maybe on, on Egyptian hieroglyphs. It's clear that we don't have writing here, but we have symbols which we can understand partially and partially not. We have here snakes, for example, it's clear, but here on symbol, it's an H-shaped sign. Uh, we don't know the uh, meaning of, of this symbol. This particular symbol appears on most of the T-shaped pillars, excavated up to now. In fact, it appears on almost every pillar at Temple D. And here an animal, an unusual animal for depictions, an insect-like animal with six legs and, and the body of an insect, very well uh, depicted. Again, three snakes here in the lower part, followed by a very small animal looking like a sheep or a goat. And again, an insect with many legs here with eight legs. Now here we had six legs with eight legs being a, clearly a spider. And this sequence is on both sides shows the heads of snakes, which we have here. But the body of this, bodies of the snakes are not on this face. They are at the other face of the pillar. So they are coming around the pillar and uh, giving here a frame to this uh, sequence of uh, motives. On the southeast face of this pillar we see crane motifs, of which there are many more at Temple D as well as the other temples. The crane shows up as a significant symbol in many cultures. It represents the teachings of Hermes in ancient Egypt, appears in the traditional Kabuki Japanese dance drama, as well as in Australian Aboriginal dances. I have also come across this symbol while researching the Anatolian Alevi faith. Günümüzden hareketle eğer bu, bu bağlar kurulursa bugün Anadolu'da halen yapılmakta olan 12 hizmet ile birlikte halen yapılmakta olan ayin cem ayini var. E, Alevilik e, içinde bir ibadet olarak ve korunmuş bir ibadet. Çünkü ibadetler insanlar tanrısal yani tanrı inançlarını, tanrı isimlerini, tanrıya yakarış biçimlerini, ritüelleri, onunla ilgili sembolleri korur. Yani diğer her şeyinden fedakarlık eder insanlar ama inançlarını korurlar. To view the Semah ritual, unquestionably the cornerstone of a Levi worship, from only an aesthetic and authentic dance perspective, would lack vision. In the Alevi faith, Semah and Crane are an integral part of the soul's symbolism. E, turna bugün turna semahı dediğimiz semahın içinde kullanılan bir şey. Turna diğer kuşlar içinde farklılık gösterir, e, tek eşlidir. Ve bu e, tanrı tanrıça diye tanımlanan e, üst bilince gelmiş evrimde üst bilince e, homo sapiens ve daha üstüne gelmiş ilerlemiş insanın tek eşli olduğunu, onun altındaki e, çok eşliliklerin daha önceki gelişmemiş dönemlere ait olduğunu. Aynı dönem içinde çok eşli insanların arasında tek eşli olanların Tanrı ve Tanrıça diye nitelendirildiğini, bunların e, semahla e, gösterildiğini e, ve e, şeyin de turnanın da bunu simgelediğini söyleyebiliriz. God, goddess, were the T-shaped representations of humans at Göbekli Tepe the first ever god depictions in mythology? The concept of God enters history a whopping 7,000 years later with the Sumerians and the Egyptians.
As the Dean of Sumerology, Noah Samuel Kramer once put it, history began with Sumer, because they were the ones who came up with the cuneiform script. Resource literature claims that the Sumerians, as well as civilizations that followed, namely the Akkadians, Assyrians and the Babylonians, all show polytheistic character. There seems to be thousands of gods. However, when it comes to the pioneers of writing, the Sumerians, my own research begs to differ. The Sagbar tablet, written in both Sumer and Akkad languages, let's hear what it says. Incantation. Oath. Insurmountable circle of oath. Insurmountable divine circle of oath. Heaven and earth's unaltered circle of oath. God is one and cannot be changed. God and man shall not be divided. Contrary to the belief of Sumerian polytheism, the unity of God and man in this text also corresponds to the mutual oneness or tevhit concept in Islamic mysticism. Could the divine circle of oath be interpreted as the zodiac? The zodiac is considered the house of the twelve constellations astronomically and astrologically home of the twelve signs of the horoscope. These same twelve constellations, as seen from Earth during its full cycle around the Sun, called a year, have always been a major topic in astronomy and are the essence of astrology. The quest for deeper knowledge on this subject claimed to have originated in China, or Babylon, or India, took me to Hyderabad. Here, I met B.G. Siddharth. My name is B.G. Siddharth. Uh, I am the founder director of the B.M. Birla Science Center in Hyderabad, India. Uh, this happened about 25 years ago and um, my academic background is that I'm an astronomer and a physicist and astronomy has brought me to the field of astronomical chronology and archaeoastronomy because um, many ancient scriptures have a lot of astronomical content in them, particularly the Indian scriptures which go by the name of Vedas and also uh, the mythology that originates from them. So uh, this interest of mine uh, has really brought me to a lot of astronomical dates. Astronomical events are like calibrators of time and uh, these dates then have to be checked with hard evidence. As you can imagine, Mr. Siddharth was a gold mine as far as this subject was concerned. Let's find out how far back humanity's involvement in zodiac signs go. The zodiacal signs uh, may not be exactly as they are today, but nevertheless the zodiacal signs were used at the dawn of civilization, uh, which is described in the Vedas, the dawn of agriculture, because these were needed for the calendar, the 12 months of the year, the 12 adityas, as they are also called, the 12 pillars, as they have been described in later mythology. These are very, very old indeed. Was the heavens unaltered circle of oath, namely the zodiac constellations, known to humanity much earlier than the scientific estimates put forward today? Ancient wisdom as well as religion was on to the number 12 more often than not. The clock we use today is based on the number 12. The Chinese calendar evolves around 12 animals. The Hittites, who ruled in Anatolia 3,800 years ago, had 12 gods. Twelve Imams are the cornerstone of the Alevi faith. As per the Old Testament, the Israelites consisted of twelve tribes. And last but not least, Jesus surrounded himself with twelve apostles. With a 6,000 year head start, could ground zero for all these twelves be the twelve T-shaped pillars in Temple D at Gobekli Tepe? 
In this context, was Temple D the Earth's unaltered circle of oath in the Sumerian Sagba text? At the center of this temple, on the front face of one of the symmetric T's facing west, namely pillar T number 31, we see the relief of a taurine head. The bull head relief is on front face, about chest high. The bull, or taurus, is also one of the 12 signs of the zodiac. Bu burçların e, gök, göksel cisimlerin belli bir kültürel e, anlayışla çok yüksek bir e, uygarlık şuuruyla e, ilişkilendirildiğinde, örneğin hermetik gelenekle ilişkilendirildiğinde daha anlamlı olabileceği kanaatim taşıyorum. Orada e, burçlarla e, insanların doğumları, genetik kodifikasyonları arasında yıldızdaki şuaların etkileştiği savu var. Ve aynı zamanda e, bunun insanda belirli karakterlere karşılık geldiği ve bu karakterlerin de hayvan figürleriyle gösterilmesinin nedeni hayata dair e, genetik yapısına dair bir evrime e, işaret etme olasılığı var. Bu bakımdan örneğin e, bir e, çakal e, söz konusu olduğunda, tilki söz konusu olduğunda bu günümüzde de La Fontaine'de de Mevlana'da da kullanılan biçimiyle e, hayvandan çok hayvanın o karakterinin insanda taşındığı anlamında. Yani Tabii. boğa e, üretkenliğin sembolü e, ve medeniyetin başlangıcı yani e, ziraati başlatan aynı zamanda unsur. Fakat boğanın aynı zamanda boğa burcu ile ilgisi olması açısından kudret sadece şeyde değildir. Doğayı işlemede bilincimizi kullanma değildir. Kendi üzerimize olan bilincimizin üretken bilincimizin sembolü de boğadır. Ve bu arketipaldir. One of the most significant cave paintings from circa 30,000 years back interpreted as vivifications of hunting parties depicting taurine figures can be found at the Altamira and Lascaux caverns. In many other cultures, we also come across similar taurine imagery. A wall painting at Chatalhoyuk in Anatolia dating back 9,000 years stands out from the rest. Portraying another hunting scene, this same theme, the introduction of the taurine cult belief, can also be seen at sacred grounds on houses within the settlement complex. Fast forward 3,000 years, and the taurine symbol appears as a god in ancient Egypt, as Hathor the cow or Apis the bull, both bearing similar significance. The sun imagery between the horns is called the royal crown. The bull symbol also emerges in Mesopotamia, a contemporary civilization with ancient Egypt. All Akkadian, Assyrian and Babylonian gods are depicted with bull horns on their heads or with headgear bearing horns. This portrayal also frequently appears on cylindric seals as well as reliefs and sculptures of that era. In fact, some archaeologists argue that the number of horns defines hierarchy among the gods. A key question emerges. Why are gods depicted in this way? This time, the answer can be found in the Old Testament, the first book of the monotheistic religions, as described in Exodus chapter 32. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. Aaron answered them, Take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made them into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. In my opinion, the answer as to why the Israelites sculpted a calf for the deity instead of a lion or camel lies in the depiction of gods in Mesopotamia. Research took me to Michelangelo's unusual Moses sculpture. In this imagery, Michelangelo puts two horns on the prophet's head. This was later decoded as a word play. 
The word keren, referring to horns in Hebrew, has a parallel meaning and comes from the same word origin as koran, translation, shining, glowing. Synonymous words play can also be found in Sanskrit, an ancient Indo-European language. The word usya has a double meaning of both horns and shining. Glowing and shining are concepts related to Jesus. It has its origins both in the adjective of Messiah and in depictions of the halo above Christ's head. It seems in all doctrines the bull is unquestionably the symbol of enlightenment, illumination and shining. Tabii tabii yani bugün ge, kadim geleneklerin hepsinde ortaktır bu. Ve hatta şeyi dikkat ederseniz e, harflerin başlangıcı olan A harfi, alfa harfi e, şeydir, boğadır. Yani bo, boynuzlu boğadır. Hatta e, çok daha ilginç e, şeyde tasavvufun e, içine girecek olursak B harfi e, şeydir, çok önemsenmiştir. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim'in başındaki B harfi önemsenmiştir. İmam Ali de B'nin altındaki noktayım diye söyler. O B harfine dikkat edecek olursak o boynuzdur. Yani e, zülkarneyindir. Çift boynuzluluktur ve altında bir nokta vardır. Bu da e, hipotalamusu yine şey ederek, e, beynin içini, iç yapısını düşünerek e, burun kökünün arkasındaki siyah noktayı da e, e, olayın içine koyarsak B harfinin ne, ne anlama geldiğini ve e, bu e, hayat enerjisi olan aslında e, seks enerjisi diye söyleniyor. Hayır, o fonksiyonları açısından e, isimlendirilir. Örneğin Freud ne diyor? Libido diyor. Libido hayat enerjisidir, yaşam enerjisidir. Yaşam enerjisini üremeye kullandığınız zaman adı cinsellikle ilgili seks enerjisi olur. Ama onu bilinç e, yapıları için, bilincin kendisi için kullandığınız zaman da kundalini enerjisi odur. Ve şeyden e, insanın e, omurgasının kökünde çöreklenmiş bir yılan gibi tasarlanmıştır. Gerçekten deneyim yapan, mistik deneyim yapan ya da meditasyon çalışmaları yapan, bizde hali istirak dediğimiz ondan sonra zikirlerle e, kendi titreşim, bilincini, titreşimini yükseltmek isteyen insanlar e, bunları denemiştir, görmüştür. Kundalini means that which is coiled in Sanskrit is associated with the snake. And this particular yoga discipline is aimed at the practice of awakening this dormant, coiled up energy. Evidently, the snake plays an important role in symbolic expression. This ancient symbol, going back all the way to Adam and Eve, and the emblem of medicine, also depicts change because of the frequent shedding of its skin. So, what can we deduce from the snake motifs at Göbekli Tepe? Most popular are the snakes, but the snakes are sometimes they are in groups. So you have not only one snake, but three or even more. So the number of the snakes is very high. Yılan sembolü ilginç hakikaten hem peygamberliklerde karşımıza çıkıyor. Özellikle Musa peygamberin asası hem Kur'an-ı Kerim'de hem Tevrat'ta kutsal metinlerde şeyin Musa'nın asasını yılana dönüştüğü ve tekrar asaya dönüştüğü. Asa kendisine sorulduğu zaman Kur'an-ı Kerim'deki bir ayette Rabbi kendisine soruyor. Elindeki nedir diye soruyor. O da diyor ki elimdeki işte bir ağaçtan kestiğim ve onunla koyunlarımı güttüğüm, kendimi koruduğum bir asadır. In the Quran, Moses and his staff come up in several surahs recounting the same story. We go to surah number 26. Moses said to them, throw what you are going to throw. So they threw their ropes and their rods and said, by the might of Pharaoh we shall certainly be victorious. Then Moses threw his staff and it swallowed up all the falsehoods they have cast. And the magicians were thrown down prostrate into prayers. They said, we believe in the Lord of the worlds. Dolayısıyla asa ir iradeyi temsil ediyor tasavvuf e, literatüründe, yani içsel öğretilerde, gnostik, ezoterik öğretilerde. Asa iradeyi temsil ediyor. 
iradenin e, insan bünyesinde iradenin güçlendirilebilmesi ya da bir insanın ilahi bir iradeye kudret başkalarına boyun eğdirecek, başkalarını yönetebilecek, koyunlarımı yönetirim, onları e, şey ederim, güderim dediği manada veya veya kendindeki hayvansal sıfatlara egemen olacak bir iradeyi oluşturabilmesi için e, yılanın yani asanın yılanın e, ayağa kalkmasını anlatıyor. Yani çölde yılan ayağa kalktı diyor. Ve bütün dikkat ederseniz firavunların da başlarında e, kobra yılanı vardır. The prevailing symbol we come across when studying ancient Egyptian wall paintings and frescoes is the snake. Symbolized in a number of different categories with varying objectives, the snake is mostly seen on the foreheads of gods as well as pharaohs. Emerging from the forehead, also called the third eye, symbolizing higher consciousness, the snake is frequently associated with the god Ptah, as well as some other gods in ancient Egypt. However, in archaeological circles, the consensus, rather, is that the snake does not represent consciousness at all. Let's get some clarification on this from one of the foremost authorities on Egyptology. Uh, Wafa El Sadiq, uh, Director General of the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. Snakes and cobras were worshipped in ancient Egypt for protection or to also to avoid the danger the snakes and cobras have, or even the scorpion. And that's why from the very, very beginning, the snakes were depicted. Evidently, one of the main characteristics of symbolism is multi-expression. Therefore, it would not be a long leap to presume that the snake, while pointing towards characteristics such as protection, change, time, and eternity, also symbolizes the awakening of the coiled-up consciousness. Then, is it too far-fetched to think that humans who have reached a higher level of consciousness are depicted in this way? O zaman insandaki zekanın, nur olan zekanın kozmik bir enerji olduğunu ve e, omurganın da bir yılana benzetilirse e, orada şahlanması gerektiğini yani içindeki enerjinin uyandırılması gerektiğini, kıyam etmesi gerektiğini düşünebiliriz. Kur'an-ı Kerim'de buna akimus salat deniyor. Yani e, şeyi, duayı diriltin, e, şeyi, e, e, enerjiyi ayağa kaldırın. While taking all of this into consideration, interpreting the snake imagery at Göbekli Tepe is somewhat complicated. Some of the T-shaped human depiction snakes face downward, others look just the opposite way, upward. It's difficult to decide whether or not the awakening of this latent energy inside the human was realized 12,000 years ago. What seems to be clear, however, is that there was an organized gathering within those 20 temples at Gobekli Tepe. Temples built long before concepts such as settlement and agriculture were adopted by hunter-gatherers. Temples which have been buried a thousand years after construction. And temples embedded in a mythological tale of animal depictions and abstract symbols. Let's dig deeper into this fascinating story by going back to India and letting B.G. Siddharth take us through a crash course on Vedas. The Vedas are the oldest surviving literature in the world. And um, they are a big mystery because nobody has really understood the Vedas. There is no clear interpretation of the various hymns. Some scholars in the past 200 years have interpreted it, trying to fit it into some historical perspective that they have. What they basically tried to prove was that the Vedas originated around 15 100 BC. But this was a conjecture. They said, you know, it is before Buddha. It is pre-Buddhist. And it must have taken about a thousand years to compose these hymns. So 1500 BC. But really speaking, 
1500 BC was just a lower limit. They could be 10,000 BC. Then how does Dr. Siddharth himself interpret the Vedas? My reading of the Vedas was completely different. I find that the most consistent interpretation of the Vedas comes from not religion, not philosophy, but astronomy. And what is the context? The context is the calendar. When human beings began an agricultural lifestyle, then they needed a calendar. And for the calendar, they have to look at the sky and get some data. This data has to be refined more and more. It is here that a meaningful interpretation of the Vedas comes. What we are facing here is a product of intellect. It was assembled by those who lived 12,000 years ago by purely just studying the sky. Then the question begs, does the pattern, the lineup of these temples, lead us back to astronomy? Why are all of them facing south? You see, uh, there could be the significance that the winter solstice takes place when the sun is uh, low in the south. So, these could facilitate observations around the winter solstice, winter time, 21st December. Uh, around that time, uh, perhaps uh, some sort of a, it was a very important time and the beginning of the year uh, in many ancient Indian traditions. And even today, our first January is after winter solstice. So uh, it could have something to do with that. And we must remember that Orion and Sirius, they appear in that part of the sky. I should say that Orion is in fact associated with 10,000 BC, the events that took place around that time. The Orion constellation and Sirius are of great significance throughout many different cultures around the world. One such calendar stands head and shoulders above the rest, a sacred calendar used in ancient Egypt based on the initial rising of Sirius, then called Sothis. Researchers such as John Anthony West and Graham Hancock are of the opinion that the Orion constellation and Sirius have had a great impact on the construction of the famous Sphinx at Giza, as well as the Great Pyramid. At Gobekli Tepe, we are unable to reach such conclusions yet. However, if we want to draw parallels with astronomy, then perhaps one of the 12 pillars surrounding Temple D, namely pillar number 43, with a myriad of symbolic depictions, could be of assistance through some of its motifs. Although part of it is still underground, the exposed part shows a bird carrying a sphere on its wings. Exactly beneath that, we see a scorpion. Again, this could really be a, a symbolic uh, representation of uh, something in the heavens. Uh, for instance, in this particular picture, there is the scorpion. There is also something that resembles a swan. Now we know that uh, the Milky Way, the whitish uh, river-like band of light in the sky, begins near Scorpius, the scorpion, the heavenly scorpion, and passes through the swan, Cygnus the swan. And that has been mentioned in Indian uh, literature as the goddess Saraswati or the river Saraswati riding a swan. In ancient um, Indian literature, uh, symbolically, uh, the sun is described as riding on a bird. Perhaps this uh, is a depiction of the bird carrying the sun with it. Numerous examples of the sun being represented as a winged disc were already found in Anatolia, Mesopotamia and ancient Egypt. What are the odds for the depictions on this pillar being the forefather of symbolic celestial expression? Quite high, 
one might say. Cosmic dust of the Milky Way, the Sun, Scorpio, but there are other striking symbols jumping out at us. For example, we haven't got a clue as to what these three signs above, resembling a basket or padlock, mean. On the other hand, the H-shaped, twice-used symbol to the right we have seen before. The most fascinating image we have yet to come across, however, is down below. A decapitated human image with a bird portrayal next to it. A similar figure was found at Chatalhöyük, dating some 3,000 years after its first appearance at Göbekli Tepe. But the interesting part is that this figure was also associated with a bird, the same as at Göbekli Tepe. And it does not stop here. There is one other remarkable aspect. While all the figures on the pillars surrounding Temple D face inward, towards the two T-shaped pillars at the center, only these two figures face outward. A decapitated human image having an erection. Would it be too far-fetched to interpret this as the immature human with no intellect succumbing to his most primal carnal urges? Let's move on and see whether the pillars of Gobekli Tepe exhibit other human imagery. Yes, we have several sculptures depicting humans, but in the reliefs we have only two until now. At first we thought the reliefs always are depicting animals. For, for some years this, uh, was this, this hypothesis was working. Animals or symbols. But since um, 2006 uh, we know there also can be included humans. And now in the enclosure F, which we discovered uh, last year, or excavated last year, again a human appeared. The most amazing of such sculptures, the Urfa sculpture, was found at the Yeni Mahale region of Urfa. Up to this day, this is the oldest human sculpture ever found. Let me draw your attention to the two stripes on the chest pointing downward. These wreaths are some ornament or some, some bracelet it's wearing. So we have a lot of beads in our findings, so bracelets made of such beads. A bracelet? The same pattern appears on the T-shapes in Temple F. Could these be pointing towards the hands seen below? And by the way, what about these hands? The hand position, it seems that he is holding its follow, so, but it's not completely clear. As we can see, the hand position on this particular one is not very clear. But, referring again to the hand position, how about the other, larger sculpture found at Gobekli Tepe? It has a, like this. Interesting, isn't it? At Gobekli Tepe, all the T-shaped pillars symbolizing human-like beings with hands and arms bear the same pattern in hand position as these later dated sculptures. Ellerin kavuşturulduğu, hani namaz kılar gibi ellerin birbirinin üzerine getirildiği bir şey var ama bu çok çok da ilginç. Hakikaten hem Tibet'te rastladığımız, Hint'te rastladığımız hem de e, antik Mısır'da rastladığımız bu firavunların e, şeylerinde kültüründe rastladığımız hem de daha sonra İslam kültürü içinde de işte namaz e, duruşu olan elin bu göbeğin altına e, konması ile ilgili bağlanması e, bize belirli bir e, meditatif e, içe dönük e, ve e, ibadet anlamında yani insanın iç güçlerini iç yetilerini harekete geçirme deneyimi on the other hand, there is no portrayal of the mouth, is there? There is no mouth, that's, that's true, that's a funny thing. In Gabegli Tepe we have a head, uh, also over life size, which clearly, or quite clearly, had been part of such a statue, again, no mouth depicted. Ağzın olmaması bir tabu olabilir. To comprehend something that was created by man 12,000 years ago is somehow tricky, especially if it has symbolic connotations. Let's take a look at Temple D again, which is surrounded by 12 T-shaped pillars, stylizing humans. One of the concentrical T-shaped pillars facing east 
exhibits two other symbols at chest level. One we have seen before, the ubiquitous H-shaped symbol. Maybe from looking at it too frequently, it started looking less and less of an H to me. The image I started to see, however, looked more like two T's holding hands. Just like this. Right below this H, there is the other symbol. A symbol I have come across during research. Could this be the forefather of ancient Egypt's royal crown symbol? Let's explore the use and meaning of this symbol in ancient Egypt. The solar disk is symbolizing the sun god. And the sun god was worshipped from the very beginning in the Egyptian history. That solar disk crown is not for people or for kings. It is for the gods and goddesses. So, what we have here is something akin to a solar disk crown, exclusive to gods and goddesses. Then what is this crescent underneath? The moon? The moon is a crescent moon, very thin moon. The sun is symbolized by the circle on top with the dot inside. Now we know that an eclipse of the sun takes place just at new moon, when the moon is even smaller than a crescent, when the moon comes and covers the sun. So this would be reference to an eclipse. In fact, this could also be a, a sculpture of the very eclipse that we were talking about, the Tripurari eclipse, which took place uh, at the same place, very near that. Tripurari, meaning three cities in Sanskrit, is an important symbolic expression in Vedas. Let's get some insight from Dr. Siddharth. Uh, there were three cities. One was made of iron, Another was made of silver, another was made of gold. And these three cities were floating in the air. Well, you can imagine what they are, because uh, the earth is associated with iron, and silver with the moon, and golden with the sun. So the three were going in the air, and one of them, was occupied by what are called Dhanavas, the very wicked people, you might say. And so they had to be, somehow, they had to be subjugated. So God said, Shiva said, okay, I will do it, but I will do it with only one arrow and only at one instant of time. And that instant came and the city was destroyed. So it clearly refers to an eclipse which occurred when the sun and the moon were in the constellation of Pushya. In my book also I had written that this would go back to 10,000 BC because we have astronomical references to that date. The solar eclipse is one of the most dramatic natural occurrences humans experience. The first historical record of a solar eclipse goes back to 760 BC. King Barakib of ancient Syria made sure that this natural phenomenon was recorded by engraving it on a sculpture, later found in Zinjirli, Anatolia. Other such records are found on Assyrian and Babylonian reliefs. Once again, we cannot help but ask, has the Gobekli Tepe solar eclipse prototype been left as a message for the future? And as the sun and the moon embrace one another in the heavens, do the two T's, by holding hands, mimic the same on Earth? Ortadaki iki te kadın erkek eril ve dişil şeydir ögedir. Ay ve güneşi koyuyor ve iki tane T'yi de karşı karşıya koyup ilişkilendirmiş. Bu kadın erkek figürü. Ve tevhid yani birliktelikleri ve hayatın onlardan doğduğu ve bunun aslında iki e, ikili ikili birlik olduğu yani kadın ve erkeğin e, eril ve dişil ögenin bütün kainatı yaratan bütün kainatın e, atomdan atom altından hatta büyük e, galaksilere kadar 
bütün süreçleri eril ve dişil ögelerin pozitif ve negatif uç, e, elektromagnetik ortamdan başlayarak organik düzeye kadar e, bu karşıtlı birliğin, karşıtlıklı birliğin birbirini devindirerek e, bütün hayatı oluşturduğu ve hareketin kaynağı olduğunu e, eğer kabul edecek olursak simgesel olarak burada e, kadın şeyini, ögesini e, ay, güneş e, ögesini de It seems pretty clear to the naked eye that male and female elements are symbolized both by the two central T's holding hands, as well as the sun and moon in a solar eclipse. But all in all, what is the message here? The quest for the first recordings regarding male and female elements took me back to the Sumerian texts. The cattle and grain text is about a Sumerian legend. It mentions a certain mound called Duku, which was of interest both to Klaus Schmidt as well as me. Funny story is this Tuku story, which is not so so so popular. But uh, I found this story in a book uh, about Sumerian gods and, and, and spirits, and uh, the, the, the mount of Tuku was mentioned there, and the Anuna gods as uh, anonymous gods without names. And on this mount, agriculture had been invented. In the cattle and grain text, this mound handed to agriculture and livestock farming as a gift from gods, is narrated as follows. In those days, Enki says to Enlil, Father Enlil, Laha and Ashnan, they who have been created in the Duku, let us cause them to descend from the Duku. At the pure word of Enki and Enlil, Laha and Ashnan descended from the Duku. For Laha, they set up the sheepfold plants, herbs they present to him. For Ashnan they establish a house, plough and yoke they present to her. Lahar, standing in his sheepfold, a shepherd increasing the bounty of the sheepfold is he. Ashnan standing among the crops, a maid kindly and bountiful is she. Could it be possible that the temples of Göbekli Tepe are behind the legend of Lahar and Ashnan, which has its origins in Duku? This word-of-mouth tale was passed along from generation to generation and thus has survived for 6,000 years. Perhaps those which the Sumerians accepted as gods were basically humans at a higher level of consciousness, displaying alternate awareness, having already reached a more developed level of evolution. Technically speaking, were those the ones leaving us these messages? There do appear to be two types. Now... One possibility is that perhaps, uh, like we have Neanderthal and others, there could have been a more advanced and a less advanced species. A hint for this comes from Ramayana, where you have humans, but you also have Vanara or semi-human. Now today, uh, we say that uh, this means monkey. But uh, they could also mean some sort of a species or even cavemen, you know, belonging to uh, an isolated region which did not advance to that extent. So that is possible. That is happening even today. There are pockets, for example, in Andaman Nicobar Islands where you have these uh, Onje and other tribes who are right from the days of the Bushmen living side by side uh, very very advanced airports and naval ships and sea ships and so on. So it is definitely a possibility. Obviously so. Then again, archaeologists take the view that there was a structure of two worlds, the rulers and the ruled. Zaten burada ana motif belli bir Toplum üzerine erk sahibi olan grubun toplumu kullanabilmiş olması. Yani kutsal varlık adına kendisi kutsal varlığın temsilcisi, yetkilisi olarak gösterip e, onun adına toplumu çalıştırmak ve kendileri bunda belli bir üst seviye çıkmak. Bu yeni bir sistem. Vaktilen Gordon çağırdığım bir lafı vardır. İşin en bozulması birinin tarlanın topraklarını bu tarla benimdir deyip herkesin evet haklısın senindir diye inanmasıdır. Ve Tanrı adına bunu ben kullanıyorum. Tanrı bu yetkiyi bana verdi. Siz de ona 
benim için çalışacaksınız demesi herkesin buna inanmasıdır der. Bu oluyor. And who might that be? Bu aşiret reisi midir? Bir kurnaz rahip midir? Bir büyücü müdür? İyi halüsinasyon gören biri midir? O ayrı bir hikaye ama. Someone who experiences positive hallucinations, perhaps this might explain the large mortars found at Göbekli Tepe. Does it look plausible that these were used for food preparation by a hunter-gatherer society? Or does it make more sense that these large devices found inside the temples were part of ceremonial rituals which took place here? Maybe the main purpose was the food preparation. So, but I wanted to add also that we can expect that something else uh, had been existing there, uh, like drugs, for example, because we know that all all societies in the world have some drugs, uh, different uh, plants or different uh, uh, roots, or I don't know what uh, what is existing or or mushrooms or such things. So we can expect that at, at Kabigli Tepe also something had been existing which we don't know. So we don't, we don't have only to ask, was it good for, for daily food, but we also have to think about other things. Especially when you are at a site where ritual uh, things had been uh, the main part of the, of the story. When we think of rituals in which natural supplies were used in abundance, then immediately one thing comes to mind. Shamanic practice, as seen in other parts of the world. Judging by that, can we draw the conclusion that it was the shamans who conducted the rituals and connected with the hereafter? It, it's a question, so, so we can expect that in, in, in Paleolithic period, uh, shamans had been existing in, in the society. They had not only been hunters and gatherers, but also a group of people uh, later being called shamans. Mm -hmm. So, but now the question is what happened in Gavigli Tepe? They are still at the level of this Ekaterian society with shamans and so on, or are they already a little bit different? Maybe they de are developing a hierarchy, a hierarchical society. And now the question is there still the level of shamans, or is the shaman already um, changed to the priest? Priest of the later periods when we know from, from Old Orient or from Old Egypt that we have a, a, a class of priests. Isn't it odd to use the phrase priest for someone as far back as 12,000 years? I don't like to use this term, but uh, we are in a level so we, we, we, we, cannot have, we cannot be sure about it because we don't have the written sources which we have later, so we have just have the stones. To examine the most crucial piece of evidence on the subject of priesthood, we go to the Ulfa Archaeological Museum. I am holding here the head of a statue that was rescued from one of Neverly Chori's temples, a Neolithic age settlement now resting at the bottom of a reservoir. Erected circa 500 years after Gobekli Tepe, this temple also has 12 T-shaped pillars similarly lined up. The structure reflects the same characteristics as the ones in Gobekli Tepe, with one significant distinction, this particular piece in my hands. The remainder of the face was destroyed. Let's take a look at the back of this original sized head and we see a snake slithering upwards. It seems it belongs to someone who has reached a higher level of awareness by the awakening of his kundalini energy. To me, that is no mystery at all. Though to many archeologists, that proves to be a great puzzle the moment we correlate the civilization with the Vedic times, that head clearly represents a Vedic priest. Even today in India, Vedic priests are like that. They have a clean shaven head and there is the pigtail, the snake-like pigtail right at the back of the head. The portrayal of a Vedic priest in Neverly Chori increases the odds of an existing clergy at Gobekli Tepe, a class which was characterized as gods in later cultures. The Ice Age had come to an end. The climate had changed. Then the question begs, following the path of geographical changes 12,000 years ago, where did they come from? The story of Atlantis. Atlantis also was supposed to have been there at that time. We have only a description from Plato, who met an Egyptian priest who told him this. But 
if you really look closely, it all refers to a civilization that existed around that time. The lost continent of Atlantis, an enigma that originated with the Greek philosopher Plato and has remained so for the last 2,400 years. Plato raises the subject of Atlantis in two of his works, Timaeus and Critias. Circular in shape and separated by canals, this elusive civilization, according to Plato, had a monument right at the center. From Plato onward, many others dug deep into this subject and the list is long, but most significantly, researchers such as Immanuel Velikovsky, James Churchwood, Charles Hapgood, Edgar Cayce, Graham Hancock and Rand Flemath have spent lifetimes trying to uncover this myth with no scientific evidence to back it up. Up to now, no one has a clue as to where this lost continent might be. Now let's go back to the Holy Scripts and look for clues on this subject. Belki de daha önceki e, kutsal metinlerde de rastladığımız bazı şeyler, kültürler battı, yok oldu ve sonra yeniden aynı e, şeyde ortamda yeniden bir kültür e, doğdu. O zaman biz e, batık kültürlerle karşılaşıyor olabiliriz Anadolu'da. Belki de Kur'an-ı Kerim'de de zikredilen At kavmi, Semut kavmi diye nitelendirilen, işte Nuh Tufanından önce diye nit e, belirli kavimler var ve onların ortadan kalktığı ileri sürümleri var. The Quran states that Eber was sent by God as a warning to the people of Ad, a people who because of the powers they possessed, put themselves above all else. And remember, when he made you successors after Noah's people and gave you a stature tall among the nations, and certainly we had established them in a prosperity and power which we have not given to you, then, as to Ud people, they behaved unjustly proud through the land, and they said, Who is superior to us in strength? This holy book also mentions another trait of the same people. Do you build a sign on every high place to amuse yourselves? And do you get for yourselves fine buildings in the hope of living therein forever? But if you turn back, then indeed I have delivered to you the message with which I have been sent to you, and my Lord will bring another people to succeed you. Dünyada birkaç kez e, yeniden uygarlık kurulduğu söyleniyor. Yani bir anlatıma göre 12. uygarlığı yaşıyoruz. Dünyada kurulmuş olan. Bir başka anlatıma göre 40. uygarlığı. Yani anlamı şu. Sıfırlandıktan sonra yeniden başlayan anlamında uygarlık. Fiziki bilgilerle temellendirirsek eğer e, dünyanın güneşin yaşı ölçülebiliyor bugün biliyoruz. Ve e, güneş sisteminin galaksinin merkezine doğru hareket edip gelme süresi biliniyor. Ve galaksinin merkezinde bir e, kara deliğin olduğu biliniyor bugün bilimsel olarak. Ve onun yakınından geçen sis, güneş sisteminin her defasında bir e, şeye, e, geleneksel söyleyiş biçimiyle bir kıyamete uğradığını ve o sürede yeniden hayat e, geliştiğini düşünebiliriz. So, in terms of perception, could the human mind compare timelessness of the universe with the average human lifespan? Commenting on what might have existed and occurred before Göbekli Tepe is as hard as predicting the aftermath. Those who built Göbekli Tepe, where did they go and how did they resume their rituals? Sanıyorum ki evcil hayvanlar sürü haline gelmeye başladıktan sonra yani koyun sürüleri, keçi sürüleri sürü haline geldikten sonra zaten sürüsün olan gitmiş, kaçmış. Çünkü zaten idari sınıf orada kalıyor, halk gidiyor. Let's look at this clay figurine 40 centimeters in size, found at a Neolithic settlement site near Adiaman, which was built about 2,000 years after the temples were buried. This site is just 70 kilometers away from Göbekli Tepe. Could this small statue be a clue to the fact that the rituals have carried on? Perhaps we can draw the same conclusion from a clay vase found at Çatal Hayuk. On this vase, we see a human figure with a T-shaped head. Can we deduce from this that three millennia after the temples were buried at Göbekli Tepe, there were people still keeping the belief system alive? Paintings found on walls of a holy site at Latmos, 
dating to circa 4,000 years after Gobekli Tepe was erected, give us a similar impression. Could the humans depicted in these paintings actually be the gods at Gobekli Tepe? The most similar complex to Gobekli Tepe is, without a doubt, the one on the Spanish island of Menorca. Built 5,000 years after Gobekli Tepe, it is as close to Gobekli Tepe as it gets. Nevertheless, there are no depictions or symbols on any of the tea pillars at that site. Could this site at Toralba den Salot be interpreted as the living remnants of a belief system long lost? Peki bunları niye bilelim? Bunlar belki de bizim e, e, insan hakkındaki bugüne kadar öğrendiğimiz bilgileri yeniden gözden geçirmeye e, ve bilimsel yeni kapılar açmaya bizi yöneltir diye önemsememiz gerektiğini düşünüyorum. Yoksa bir, e, bir takım bugüne kadar öğrendiğimiz, ezberlediğimiz bilgilerin esareti altında olmuş olabiliriz. Onları gözden geçirme olanağını bize sağlıyor olabilir. Final solution uh, we don't have for the moment. It's an argument to excavate more, also to excavate other circles, not just to have more stones and more pillars and, and so, but to understand better what is the story this Stone Age people wanted to tell the visitor or the, the, the observer with these images, with these pictures. There is still so much we don't know and cannot decipher about Gobekli Tepe from what the rituals really meant, to why were the floors waterproof? What went on in there? Why were they buried a thousand years after construction? There are a lot of questions with no answers. As to who ran the show... I had actually predicted that there would be a civilization of this date, uh, which would be a Vedic civilization. We can be certain of this though, Undoubtedly, they were the ones with a higher awareness. Worship was a crucial part of their existence. And ultimately, they left us the end product of their consciousness. And with every passing day, another layer of the mystery gets uncovered. As long as we keep an open mind to the unknown, there is still a lot to be discovered and learned from what comes out from beneath the ground at Gobekli Tepe. This first temple, on this tiny planet, in our vast universe.